thank you all for joining us today for this breakout session, uh, creating an operationally sound news organization, which is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And I'm super excited um, to have Lisa joining us from Lion, um, who are a fantastic, fantastic organization um, in support of, of newsrooms as well. Uh, Lisa Hayamoto is the Director of Teaching and Learning at Lion Publishers. She helps independent news organizations reach sustainability by designing training programs, coaching, and consulting opportunities, and practical resources that help publications become more operationally resilient, financially healthy, and journalistically impactful. She was previously a journalism educator and program coordinator at the University of Oregon and a reporter at the Seattle Times and the Sacramento Bee. She is based in Eugene, Oregon, where, as she tells us, it's been raining nonstop for four months. <laughs> uh, Lisa, thank you so, so much for joining us at INN Days. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much, Soraya. I am delighted to be here. Um, I see um, some uh, wonderful folks in the um, audience here, so I'm really excited to, uh, to chat about operations, the sexiest topic in the world but it is. So wanted to tell you a little bit about Lion, um, if you are unfamiliar, though I know many folks here are Lion members. So um, we're an independent um, news support organization. Our vision is a world where independent news orgs are thriving. They're providing equitable access to inclusive and impactful news and information. Um, and our mission is to sort of make that happen through teaching resources community um, to really support independent entrepreneurs as they build and develop their sustainable businesses. Next slide, please. So just a little overview of the org. Um, we have 419 members as of a couple days ago and growing. Um, we've got a vibrant Slack community with more than a thousand members. Um, we've got a newsletter that comes out every Thursday that you should definitely subscribe to if you don't. Um, we've got 4,000 plus subscribers there. Um, and we've really started um, providing more programs with direct funding for news organizations. And we're growing tremendously in that realm. So in 2021, we provided about $600,000 uh, direct funding to members. And then here in 2022, we've upped that to 1.3 million, and we've still got a few more opportunities up our sleeve, so stay tuned for that. Um, and as an organization, we have grown tremendously um, as more and more folks have both recognized the importance of local independent news, and also um, more organizations have launched and grown in this space, so it's super exciting. Next slide, please. Little bit about our members. Um, so we serve uh, news orgs regardless of their tax status and the majority of our members are for profit. So about 63%. Uh, the majority also are doing local news so they cover a city or county. Um, once you kind of like blow that out to sort of like region and state, uh, that is almost all of our members. So we are a majority serving folks who are serving some definition of local. Um, about a third of our members are three to nine years old. Um, so we've got, you know, a range of age of organization, but that's kind of the, well, I'm not going to say the majority because that's a third, but uh, that's where that is. And most of our organizations are quite, quite lean, right? Operating with fewer than five full-time employees. Um, most folks are operating, you know, with just one or two. So we really try to tailor our services to the reality of operating a lean organization. Um, We've got 22% founders of color, which is uh, a near and dear to my heart because that number is growing, especially in organizations who are launching. So um, this to me is extremely exciting and a real promising opportunity for organizations and those they serve. Um, and then the medium annual, median annual revenue for our uh, organizations is $125,000, which um, you know, these are lean bootstrap type organizations, but the good news here is that number has actually jumped pretty tremendously, even just in the last year. So organizations are really growing their revenue and becoming able to do um, more of the things that they want to do. So that's some promising news there. Next slide, please. 
So I won't go too much into this, um, just as kind of a snapshot of what we offer. We're do, we do some sort of big picture industry mapping and strengthening. Um, we offer some services to our members like media liability insurance and access to um, lawyers who will work pro bono to help news orgs figure out their legal things. We have a lot of celebration moments. We are holding a conference, um, an in-person conference in October in Austin called the Sustainability Summit. We're partnering there with News Revenue Hub and Rev Lab at the Texas Tribune. We would love you all to come. Um, we offer peer support. We offer training and resources. We just launched this thing we're really excited about called the News Entrepreneur Academy, which is um, an online training resource for folks to access trainings around all aspects of running a news organization whenever they want at their own pace. So really excited about that. We also, also offer programs um, and all of them have direct funding associated with them, including um, the Lion Meta Revenue Growth Fellowship. I see some of our cohort members in the house, which is exciting. Welcome. Um, and then also the Sustainability Audits and Funding Program, which I will talk more about in a minute. Next slide, please. So I wanna start getting into sort of the meat of things. Um, we are really focusing our efforts around helping news organizations become more sustainable. And when we started this work, the first thing that we really were grappling with was, okay, everybody knows they need to be sustainable. Everybody wants news organizations to be sustainable, but, but like, what does that actually mean? So we set out to define it. Um, and so we've done so through what we call these three pillars. Um, so we have financial health, which is the money, right? We have journalistic impact, which is you know the good that the journalism is doing out in the world. And then we have operational resilience, which is sort of the, the glue that holds it all together. Um, and we really feel like these three pillars really need to all be there and functioning strongly and helping the news organization to thrive. Because if there's sort of fundamental weaknesses in any area, um, you end up either broke, right? Like if you don't have the money, or if you've got the money and you've got the great operations, but your journalist journalism isn't having the impact that you would want, then you're not as effective as you'd like to be. Um, and crucial, I think, to a lot of folks is if you've got you know some financial health going on and some journalistic impact going on, but those operations aren't really working as well as they could be, then you're burnt out. Um, and that operational piece is kind of what I want to talk about today. Next slide, please. So. Um, because I'm a journalist, I love a good metaphor, um, and I imagine you all do too. So I want to kind of like blow out this, you know, sustainability diagram here to talk about what that looks and feels like um, for those who are doing this work. So like, let's say that your news organization is a train, right? Next slide. So the financial health is the engine of that train, right? This is the money. Like you can't move without that revenue coming in, without those uh, financial, the financial health that makes the whole thing go. Next slide. But trains carry things, right? So the cargo, and that's your journalism. Whatever it is that you're producing, the products that you make, the things that you uh, create, that's sort of the cargo of the train and the financial health engine is enabling you know, the train to go with the things. But this is a really crucial difference that I really wanna underscore here. The cargo of your train is the journalism, right? But if your journalism, the cargo, doesn't get to where it needs to go, next slide. If it doesn't get to the people who need it in the way that they need it and makes sort of a difference in their world, then, then the journalism isn't having sort of the impact that it can. So again, like, yes, do the great journalism, but you really, it's important to really think about is that journalism reaching the people it needs to when it needs to in the way that it needs to, because that's incredibly important. And that's that journalistic impact piece. And then finally, next slide. Your operational resilience is the track that the train is going on, right? It's the engine that's moving it forward, but you can't actually go anywhere without the operational resilience, the sort of like things that make it all work. Um, so uh, that's my really, you know, I really leaned into this metaphor and had a lot of fun uh, making it, but hopefully that gives you 
um, a strong idea of exactly kind of what we're talking about, how these pieces all fit together. Next slide, please. So in general, we think all of these things are very important, but they kind of come in a particular order. So um, after, you know, you've launched an organization or maybe, you know, you've been around for a while, you really want to make sure that you've got some traction with your audience, that people are kind of digging what you're doing, right? Um, that there's, there's some there there that people need. But then we really do believe that if you want to be a sustainable news organization, you need to immediately start working on that operational resilience piece because that's the track that enables everything to go. Then, right, you're working on the financial health to make sure that you're getting a, a good, strong engine. And then your longer term out, outcomes are really making sure that the journalism is absolutely doing what it needs to be doing. So kind of an order of operations here. Next slide. So today we're going to talk about operational resilience, which is my favorite one of these three pillars because I feel like it is the unsung hero of sustainable journalism organizations. It's that like piece that is, you know, you don't often think about it, but it's really, really important. And I want to talk a little bit more about that today. Next slide. So just so we're clear about what we're talking about, this is the definition of operational resilience, right? It's the systems, the processes, the policies, the company culture, right? The way it feels to be working um, that support the staff, manage growth, right? It's not just about growing, it's about managing that growth, growing smartly um, that prevent, right? Inefficient work, ineffective work, burnout, which I think many of us are all too familiar with, and then, of course, turnover, which was very expensive and disruptive to organizations. So that's what we're talking about today. The things that make this happen. Next slide. So, um, again, just to really hammer this home, right? Like, if the operational resilience isn't really strong in an organization, then your train track is, is broken. It's missing pieces, right? Like, now I've reached the limit of my knowledge about trains, but you know, the track part isn't lining up right, or, you know, there's some bottleneck or something like that. And a lot of times you don't notice it until it's like kind of a really big problem. And then it really takes some time and effort to go back and figure out what's going on and fix the thing. A lot of times people don't feel like they have that time. Um, and so this is how things kind of go, oh, off the rails. Oh, I didn't even mean to do that. So, um, Yes, uh, I'll be here all week, folks. Um, next slide, please. So <laughs> thank you for appreciating my um, really overdone metaphor. Um, so I want to talk about those moments where sort of the train tracks aren't, aren't working like they need to. Yes, thank you, try the view. I love it. Um, so I want to talk about those pain points and sort of like what they are and then to dig into a little about, okay, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of a larger problem. What is that? And what might be some potential solutions to that? Um, so let's start with the first one. Uh, next slide. So this is a pain point that I feel is all too familiar to many of you, which is having to answer every question and solve every problem yourself for everyone around you. Um, I am a mother and a former teacher, and I am deeply familiar with this in my um, sort of out, out of this screen life. But I'd love to know from all of you, and this is going to be our first poll, how often do you feel like you have to do this? Well, we've got some folks who are not feeling this pain, but we have some folks who feel it acutely, and those who are trying to, uh, to solve this problem. So... That's great. That's a great um, mix of folks. I'm very jealous of those who do not feel this pain. So um, next slide, please. Oh, well, next slide. <laughs> so in my estimation and what I've seen with the news organizations that I've worked with, the sort of actual root problem of this pain point is there isn't enough clarity around expectations, roles, context, and direction. Right. So a lot of news organization leaders, they hold a lot of the stuff in their head um, and it really benefits. Next slide, please. 
to take the time to really document all of the things so that people can find them on their own. Ooh, next slide, please. So clear, accessible internal documentation, I just think is critical to really heading off this problem at the pass. This takes a long time and it's kind of a pain, um, but it is so worth it because then you can get folks in the habit of checking there first before they check with you. And, um, and that really solves a lot of issues. Um, a lot of times what we've seen uh, too is um, news organizations without a really clear strategic direction often have to sort of like answer all these one-off questions because the folks that they're working with in whatever way just aren't really clear of the why um, and sort of that North Star to aim to and they wanna make sure they're you know doing the right thing. So really clear strategic direction can help there. Racy charts are like my favorite thing in the world. If you haven't encountered these, it's just a responsibility matrix where you really clearly line out who's responsible for doing the thing who's accountable for making sure the thing gets done, and basically who is like consulted or informed about the thing. And if you take the time to really make that clear, not just in sort of like the small tasks, but in the overall category of tasks with you know the freelancers you work with or board members or co-founders or anybody, right? Um, that can really solve a lot of, of questions because people know who's supposed to do what. And sometimes you don't really want to like be clear about that because it feels awkward. Um, but really taking that time to work through that awkwardness and making it clear goes a long way. And then, of course, leveraging other stakeholders, right? Like, can someone else be responsible for that thing? Is there someone else who might have the pieces um, that can share this load with you? Um, so, yes. Next slide, please. Here's another pain point, too many plans, not enough time. Um, I imagine there are many folks who have experienced this. Um, my question for you, and this is the next poll, if you experience this pain, why do you think you are experiencing it? <laughs> I'm glad you're feeling seen, Jessica, because these are problems that a lot of people have and don't talk about. So that's what we're doing here today. So go into your poll, and um, if you've had this pain, why do you think it's happening? We've got mission creep, saying yes, not enough strategic direction. Um, oh my gosh, these are great. Overly optimistic about bandwidth, shamefully looks down, right? Oh, too confident, that's an interesting one. Mm-hmm, not enough staff. Oh my gosh, more fun to chase ideas. Yes, right? Coming up with something new is often a lot more fun than making the current thing work, right? Absolutely. Oh, these are really great. Okay, next slide, please. So um, my theory here, just based on what I've seen, and some folks really hit on this is, is this is a, a, the cause here is a lack of clarity on strategic priorities, right? Like not just the strategy of it, but the why and the what is the most important. Um, and so it's hard to know like where you need to be putting in your effort if you're kind of like a little all over the place with, um, with where you're going. So um, next slide, please. So this is where you really need to kind of like do that hard work to figure out like, okay, what am I trying to do and what is the most important? So that's where user research, talking to your, you know, your readers and figuring out, you know, doing some audience research to figure out what their priorities are so you can align what you're offering with that. Market research, what can you do in your market um, in terms of like revenue generation? What's possible? Opportunity sizing, which is like one of my favorite things, which is figuring out whether an opportunity is actually worth pursuing. Takes some time on the front end, totally worth it on the back end. Um, doing some experiments, trying small things, um, seeing how they work and then pivoting depending on what you learn. Setting goals, but having them be data informed, right? And then tracking those goals and having like the metrics that matter and, and sort of like really knowing what you're doing each step of the way. And then it makes it clear what you need to be doing. Um, so, yes. Next slide, please. All right. These next two ones are kind of similar. Up nights, worrying you'll make payroll. This is a very specific pain point that I hear about 
all the time. Um, so to me, next slide. The problem there is not enough attention to financial planning, right? Um, if we don't know what's coming in and what's going out and where we're at in terms of our cash flow, then of course we're going to worry about it. But just, you know, digging into those finances a little. Next slide. Yeah, if you're projecting your cash flow, these are all the like financy things, right? Then you know exactly how much money you have for payroll. Um, if you're doing some budget modeling where you're sort of figuring out like what are your assumptions that you're keeping in mind when you're figuring out, you know, what are your revenue, what are your expenses and figuring out how those pieces all fit together. You're checking in at various points throughout the year um, to see where you're at in terms of what you budgeted, what you have left, how you're doing, whether you guessed correctly, because let's be honest, budgeting is mostly guessing, right? But you can be um, informed in those guesses. Um, next slide, please. Similarly, um, running a news business, being a, a leader in a news organization, you have a lot of responsibility. And I would hazard to bet that you spend some time worrying about worst case scenarios, um, which can really keep someone up at night. Um, next slide. So to me, um, this can be addressed through risk management. If you actually sit down, next slide. If you actually sit down and you assess the what these risks are and what the likelihood is and what you can put in place to prevent them, but you can't always prevent them. So sometimes you just figure out on the front end, if this thing happens, how will I manage it? That can really set your mind at ease because you've got a plan. Like you know what you're working with. Um, it's that sort of like unknown feeling that I think is like most of that, you know, pain point. You can also leverage your thought partners to really talk this through, think this through. Um, next slide, please. So in the interest of naming our fears to make them less powerful, um, let's do another poll. <laughs> what keeps you up at night or is your worst case scenario? The money. Yep. And staff getting sued. Yes, absolutely. Having to all of a sudden stop or not being able to keep going. Mm, reputational risk. Absolutely. People leaving. Yes. <laughs> Literally not enough time to get critical things done. Yes. If we all could add hours to the day or, you know, another brain or an extra set of arms, that would be amazing. Seeing a lot here around um, staffing and money and legal issues. Absolutely. Yes, all of this. This is so good. You know, what's interesting, though. Um, these are big, huge, scary things, but they're actually fairly predictable. They're the risks of a news business, a news organization are actually like you can kind of guess what they're going to be. And so if you take the time to really do that risk assessment and lay it all out and kind of make a plan for it, you're going to sleep better at night and you'll be prepared for, you know, when because there will be things that happen, those things happen. So that's the, um, the, the pain point there. Next slide, please. Here's the last pain point that I feel like is so, 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 so painful, um, which is feeling overwhelmed, overworked, uninspired, or just plain burned out, right? Um, this is something that uh, I am so glad that we as an industry and as sort of a culture are talking about more and more because this is very real. And this is very, very real in the local independent news space because um, everybody's really passionate about what they do and they want to do it really well and they want to do it, you know, as much as they possibly can to keep serving their communities with good information and it gets to be too much. So the problem here, which will come as no surprise, is being overextended on bandwidth and capacity. So the way I think about these two um, words is bandwidth is like what you can reasonably do in X number of hours or with X amount of you know resources or X amount of time or whatever, right? So that's what you can do. The capacity is 
how well you can do it, right? Or if you are able to do it. So those are two slightly separate things, which come with kind of like, I think it's useful to think about them separately because like maybe I don't have enough time to do the thing or maybe I don't really know how to do the thing. And those are two different things. Um, so some solutions there. The list could go on and on and on. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's about right sizing goals, obligations, and expectations. It's about being really honest with yourself, your peers, your team, your co founder, your board, anybody. What can we really reasonably do here? Because every day I make my to do list. And if I get overly ambitious and I put too many things on it, then at the end of the day, I, I feel like crap because I feel like I didn't do it, right? But if I'm really honest with myself about what I can get done in my work day, and that's what I put on my to-do list, by the end of the day, I feel kind of amazing because I've checked all those things off, right? Um, one of the things that I'm a big fan of is team health tracking. This is basically like operationalizing that feeling that you have about your work, how much you're getting done, how productive you are, how you feel about things, how you're growing, how you're interacting. Um, so at Lion, for example, we track our team health every week um, and we have a meeting where we specifically talk about um, what's going well and we're excited about um, what we're looking forward to and then like what like sucks, basically. Um, and then we assign ourselves a color, um, red, yellow or green. And um, and then we add up all the colors to see where we're at as a team. And this seems like, OK, that's cool. That's easy but it's actually data. So I was having an experience about a year ago where I was really burnt out, um, but I kind of wouldn't recognize it in myself. I was like, oh no, no, it's fine. Like, you know, I can get through this. I just need this one thing to happen and then everything will become easier. But I didn't realize that I kept saying that until someone on my team pointed back to our record of team health and said, you've been yellow for like three months. And it was that piece of data that finally convinced me to look it in the face. Right. So these things can be really useful in a lot of different ways. Um, and then if you're a leader or a founder, um, starting to think about succession planning, um, even if that's quite a ways off. Right. That's taking those little pieces one step at a time and seeing kind of who you can bring, bring in um, that might be able to do that. So last poll. Because I am always interested in this. What have you done? to address burnout, that bandwidth, that capacity. Maybe you've done it for yourself. Maybe you've instituted it in your organization. Maybe you've seen someone else do it and you aspire to one day do it. What are some, um, some things that have worked for you? Delegating, yes. Oh, I love this. Passed off three of my jobs to other people and started to treat this like my job, not my child. Oh, I love that. Oh, perfectionism, guilty. <laughs> yes, blocking out time for lunch. I get so cranky on those days that I don't, don't get to eat lunch. And like, yes, I just need to do that because I am a human and we need to eat. Ooh, calm days. Oh, I love that. Yes, getting off the slack. Oh, taking an hour at the end of the day. That's wonderful. Ooh, long weekends. I mean, better than nothing, right? Yes, these are wonderful. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, next slide. So um, I just want to tell you all about something that we've got cooking here at Lion. So um, because we often are all sort of terrible judges of our own sort of situations, We've created a program to help folks really get sort of a big high level and in the weeds assessment of their news organization um, to really figure out sort of like what needs to happen to become more sustainable. So it assesses where folks are, digs really deeply into all of these pillars of sustainability that I've outlined for you today. Um, and because we know that no two news organizations are the same, we also um, have sort of a mechanism in this program to really take into account the context and the nuance and the really individual things about each organization. 
um, working with like a marvelous, we call them audit analysts, which sounds scarier than it is. It's basically a lovely expert who will work with you. Um, and then we surface progress and next steps. So really laying out like, what are your strengths and opportunities? What stage of sustainability do we think you're in? What have you got covered? What have you to be achieved? Um, how you compare to other organizations? Um, and then a list of prioritized recommendations for next steps. And critically, exactly how to do those next steps and direct funding to implement them. So um, any Lion member can apply for this program. Um, we are going to conduct sustainability audits on 100 organizations this year. We're really excited about it. We're just finishing up our first 25 this week, in fact. Um, and folks have said that it's just really, really valuable and, and really kind of helps them see where they're at and where they need to go. So um, I hope if you are Lion members, you apply to this program. Next slide. Finally, I just wanted to share some insights that we have learned, not only from this program, but for other programs, in hopes that it may help you um, sort of chart out your next steps towards sustainability. Um, so again, I, I really firmly believe and, and have seen this in action time and again, that that path to sustainability starts with operational resilience. If you don't have the track that enables the train to go, it doesn't matter how strong your engine is and it doesn't matter how great your cargo is, you just, you can't move, you're stuck, right? Um, operations tend to be a really low priority for most organizations, but it also creates the most pain points. So um, there's a, you know, incentive to address it there. One of the things that is really interesting is that um, sort of that focus on operational resilience is something that we see no matter the age or stage of a news organization. So it doesn't matter if you launched two months ago or 20 years ago, well, 20 years would be a lot, but 10 years ago, a lot of those pain points are still the same. Um, or if you're like a big, huge organization or a really small organization, the attention to operations is equally as vital. And in, in some cases more so the, the larger you get, right? Um, one of the things we always try to underscore because this is something we've seen time and time again, a lot of times, um, you know, we all kind of want that silver bullet, that like big thing. Maybe it's a windfall of money or maybe it's like hiring that amazing person. We're kind of looking for that that big thing, that game changer. But honestly, like the path to sustainability, you know, those game changers can be catalysts. But really, it's those small, focused, intentional, impactful steps constantly or consistently that move you along, which kind of takes the pressure off in a lot of ways, but it also means, you know, more attention. Um, and what sustainability is looks different to every news organization. And getting back to that kind of, you know, that that big magic wand type moment, um, really want to underscore what we've seen time and again, which is that money alone doesn't solve problems. Um, and in fact, getting a big windfall of money really underscores more that need for operational resilience because any of those operational pain points that you were experiencing before that big windfall are going to get much worse. Um, so money alone, like I think about staffing, for example, right? Like people are like, oh gosh, I just really want like another person. And, and yes, like that would be amazing. But I'm a parent, right? And I I've got two children. And I think, well, okay, you know, maybe you've got one kid and you're like, I sure would like another kid so that my kid would have someone to play with. And like, yes, that would be great, right? Like that takes some of the onus off of you to entertain your kid all the time. It makes your kid happy. Um, but now all of a sudden you've got, you know, two kids and you've got two kids worth of expenses and two kids worth of sort of like daily needs. And now you've got to manage those two kids fighting as well as playing together, right? So there's all these sort of things that are introduced with a new person that you really want to address systematically to make sure that you're really able to capitalize on, um, on, on that new person and all of the wonderful things they bring. So not to like infantilize this situation by talking about it in terms of, you know, parents and children, but just something that I, I think about a lot. Next slide. And that's it. A few questions in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, one of them...
from Sonam. What are some good tools you've seen for opportunity sizing? Mm. I mean, the sort of like impact to effort matrix, like a chart, I think is one that is is basic, but is really important. So you're just basically trying to figure out like how hard is the thing you want to do versus like how much is it going to move the needle? And you want to, of course, first address, um, you know, things that are easy and make a big impact. That's the dream. But more likely, you're going to spend a lot of time kind of figuring out like, okay, what um, those sort of medium places. So that's the most basic one. Um, And I don't have any more offhand right now, um, but I am currently developing a program around this. Um, So I am really going to be digging into it and hopefully have a lot to share very specifically um, very soon. Um, We have another question from Rhiannon. How do you do things like team health tracking or getting feedback in a culture where people are highly averse to more meetings? Well, it doesn't have to be a meeting. Um, I mean, you, if you want to kind of like talk it through and have that kind of like coming together around it moment, great, have a meeting, but you can just basically have like a Google doc where each week, you know, everybody fills out their kind of team health, however it is you've structured it. And then people just kind of read them on their own. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have to be sort of that, that in-person moment. And then, right, like you could have fun with that data, right? Like you could be like, here's, you know, how we've been as a team over the course of X, Y, Z, or, um, you know, here's things that everybody gets excited about all the time, right? Like you can use them as sort of like team coming together moments um, asynchronously. Um, Yeah, just right off. That made me wonder whether that's something that we could like build into Slack or something like that that's recurring. Um, my, yes. My new favorite thing is um, the Slack workflow. So basically you create a little form in whatever Slack channel you want, and then you just click on the little like lightning bolt and it brings it up and you could track team health in there. And then it goes right into the Slack channel and like everybody can see it. Um, so that could be like a, you know, every Tuesday morning, make sure you fill out your team health Slack thing. Um, and then that's a nice way to keep track. And then you can actually have that info go into like an air table or a Google sheet or something like that. So then you can have it, um, you know, recorded somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting actually quite a, a few questions around this, uh, team health tracking. Laura's asking about, uh, any resource to get a better understanding of what it is and how to set that up. Um, that might be something that we bug you for, Lisa, uh, after after the conference. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's it's actually kind of personal in a way, right? Like, I will not stop talking about this one news organization where they started tracking their team health in the same way that they did the other like key performance indicators, like you know, revenue or number of you know grants applied for or you know number of ads sold they each each person on the staff came up with their own personal metric for team health so for one person it was you know i work out three times a week Um, for another person it was i have dinner with my family four times a week right and i think like when we hear those on their face if they sound sad right but like (laughs) <laughs> these things are important. And so like these people knew, like if I am not eating dinner with my family four times a week, then something is wrong. Right. Like, and that mm-hmm. I, if I can't meet that metric. Then like, what am I doing? So they started tracking that week over week over week. Um, and it was just a proxy for sort of like overall mental health and balance. So you really could do it, you know, a lot of different ways. So I, I like that customization also, because it makes it a little bit, um, it brings it into a territory that that we're able to talk about that isn't so much like how was your mental health today, which might be a conversation that folks, you know, may or may not be wanting to have in the context of of, of work. Um, we have a, a question from Virginia: How can you reach out for help 
slash be transparent about financial vulnerability without people losing confidence? Like as a news organization? I believe so. Virginia, you can type in the chat to clarify. Yes, yes. Marvelous. Hi, Virginia. It's lovely to see you here. Um, I mean, I think a lot of that is about framing, right? And, and sort of goal setting. Um, maybe you are doing some sort of campaign around, you know, we need a new camera or like we'd like to hire this person or we want to keep our Report for America fellow on going forward. And you figured out like how much money that's going to cost and you do some sort of campaign around it where you're asking folks for money for this specific thing. Like they don't need to know that if this doesn't work out, it's going to be devastating to your organization, but it's a clear goal that people can help you help you do, right? Like you can, it's like sort of strength-based outreach. So maybe it's your, you know, your call to action on your website. It doesn't have to be like, you know, donate to us or we'll go out of business, right? But it's like, you're really thinking about, okay, what is your, what is your audience need from you? What are they here for? And then you say, you know, support, XYZ news organization to get all of the local education news that you need to make decisions for your kids. That's a really long call to action button, right? But um, it's really thinking about what's in it for folks rather than like how you would be devastated if it didn't happen. Um. Pat is asking if we can bring back the sustainability audit slide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Katie is on that. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, we have five more minutes. So if there's any more questions for Lisa, please do drop them in the q and I'm going to toggle back and forth between the Q&A and the chat to make sure we, we've caught everything. But um, feel free to drop things into the Q&A. And thank you for monitoring that, Soraya. I said I would, and now I find myself unable to do so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fun, actually. And then for the folks asking about the RACI charts, um, RACI stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, Informed. There's also another version uh, where the R is a, it's a DACI chart, I think. Um, And yeah, Lisa, if you want to maybe talk through like how how you've used them in, uh, in more detail. Absolutely. As I mentioned, these are one of my favorite things. I was not aware of them at all until I started at Lion, and then they became quickly my new best friend. So I'll tell you a little bit about the way that we use them. Um, so we have an organizational racy chart where we've really thought through like what are the buckets of things that we do. And then what are the things that have to happen within those buckets? And then we've assigned out like, who does this? Who makes sure that it um, you know, happens? And then who is consulted and who just kind of keeps tabs? So we have that organizationally and it's really, it's really um, useful. So for example, um, you know, we work with X group and Y group, right? But our organizational racing makes it clear that team member A works with X group. Team member B works with Y group. And there would have been a lot of opportunity for that to get confusing and muddled. And there'd have to be a lot of like daily, like, are you going to do this? Or like, should I do this? Da -da 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 -da. But we spell it out at the beginning. This person does this stuff. This person does that stuff. Um, we also, whenever we like do a new thing, we have a project kickoff. Um, and this is a meeting where we really talk through, okay, like, what are we doing? What are our goals? And then we have a racy chart for that project. So here's who's doing what on that project. And then again, that really limits the questions and the confusion. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of how else we might use racies. Um, but you could I use can it. Add... Yeah, please. Oh, sorry. There's, there's what's been helpful for me uh which was like a really big light bulb moment for me is that sometimes the racy chart can also illuminate when, when there's things that you can't resolve in a racy chart, that's a flag. And for me uh, on more than one occasion, it has been a flag that like, there's actually something way back in old job descriptions where people really do 
I mean, they're both correct. They're like, oh, wait, this is my job. And then someone else is like, wait, this is my job. And that gives you a hint to like how far back you have to dig. And, and I've found that uh, a couple of times it's been uh, like a seed that was misplanted in a job description five years ago or something like that. So they're, they're useful in, in kind of immediate uh, what's in front of you uh, short term, but also as you are um, thinking about like long-term hiring plans and, and the expansion of staff, um, I, I found them useful uh, in, in that kind of view as well. Well, and also like racy charts can illuminate like why you're feeling burnt out. Like if you make a racy chart and you're responsible for like everything, that's why you're burnt out. Or if you're responsible and accountable for everything, that means like everything's on you. So they can be really illuminating when you look out across the whole team and be like, well, who's doing what? Or to clear up, as Soraya said, some some kind of like way back miscommunication. We have, I don't want to rush anyone. This is like such a good, like, quick conversation. Um, we have one minute left. So final uh, speak now or hold your piece uh, as far as questions for Lisa, although not really because the platform here is very cool. You can uh, direct message folks. You can keep this conversation going. Um, if, if you would like, we're continuing to have huddles throughout the day and we'll be doing these throughout the next, the next few days of the conference. Um, but if there aren't any more uh, questions, Q&A questions for Lisa, um, we are pretty much at time. So um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. and.